Outkick the show. I'm your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I hope all of you are having a fantastic Thursday, wherever you may be across this great country. I was just up in D.C. the last couple of days, and you can see, I mean, I basically have no hair now on the side of my head. You see this? A little bit of a uh, behind-the-scenes hair. And I've got all sorts of hair on top of my head. This is a disaster of a haircut. Knew it was going bad as soon as it started. I was in uh, Georgetown, up in D.C. Rarely do I ever have lunch. Not that I have a tough situation, but I'm live on the radio from 11 to 2, Monday to Friday. So people always email me, and I know whether or not they actually have any clue about what I do for a living. Anybody who ever emails me and is like, hey, can you do lunch? I basically don't ever respond because I'm like, you have no idea what I do for a living. If you are inviting me to lunch, it's impossible for me to go to lunch. I'm live every day from 11 to 2, then I do this show. So I rarely am just kind of walking around during the middle part of the day. I wake up in the morning, get the kids off to school, help with that prep to be able to sit and talk for three or four hours every day, which is what I do. So I'm rarely like totally free. I'm touring colleges with my 16-year-old, which is a crazy experience because it means that I'm old enough to soon have a kid in college, which is wild. And, uh, and so we have time to kill during the tours, go to lunch, which I never get to do. There's a barber shop next door. And I sat down, and about three minutes into the haircut, as my hair is pouring down everywhere, I think to myself, I'm probably in a rough spot. And then it ends up where he just leaves a ton of hair on top of my head, which this may be a popular haircut for guys in their 20s is an awful haircut. I think I'm going to just have to go straight buzz and let my hair grow back out. That's kind of my thought process right now because I like this poofy stuff on top of the head. I don't know what sense it makes. Anyway. This is my struggle. Uh, Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app where you could turn $10 into $1,000 in one game watching your favorite sport this summer. Uh, NBA Finals, more to Prize Picks. There's only one game probably left. I'm going to get into that. Uh, so do the, so the star players. I'm going to give you uh, picks tomorrow. Boosted payouts, hookups, all that stuff. When the finals are over, it doesn't end. Whether you like Major League Baseball, maybe there's still some Stanley Cup finals to play, College World Series, uh, WNBA, all of that. You can get hooked up every Wednesday and Saturday in June. If your lineup doesn't win, you get your money back, which is pretty incredible. Prize picks, injury insurance. If your player gets hurt, your lineup can stay in play, even if one of your players gets injured. Uh, and if you have a player who exits the game in the first half, doesn't return in the second, they don't count it as a loss. Download the app today. Use the code OUTKICK for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. That's code OUTKICK for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Uh, all right. A uh, bunch of stuff that's going on out there. I haven't come and talked to you guys yet about the Hunter Biden verdict because it came down on Tuesday before I got this awful haircut. But while uh, I was touring colleges with my 16-year-old in D.C. Uh, so Hunter Biden guilty verdict. I've got two big takes from it. And I talked some. You might have heard this yesterday on Clay and Buck. I did the show from D.C. But let me hit all of you with this. Number one A lot of comparison between Hunter Biden's guilty verdict and Trump's guilty verdict. I haven't heard hardly anyone else point this out, which is Hunter Biden was convicted by the best possible jury pool that he could have. That is Wilmington, Delaware City in the state that his dad has represented for nearly 50 years in his home state. If you were going to charge Hunter Biden with a crime and Hunter Biden got to pick where he would stand trial for that crime, I think he would probably pick Wilmington, Delaware, yet he was still found guilty there. That's consequential. Best possible jury pool found Hunter Biden guilty. Trump got found guilty by basically the worst possible jury pool for him. Everyone who wants Trump guilty is in New York City, in Manhattan, by and large. He didn't even get Staten Island, 
for those of you who knew, know New York City, that's where somebody might be voting for Trump uh, in large numbers. And they found him guilty there. But if Trump got to pick where his jury trial would be, I don't think there's any possibility Trump would have been found guilty in West Virginia or Wyoming or Alabama or my home state of Tennessee, where there is many more Trump voters there. I haven't heard very many people talk about this, but I think it's pretty significant. That's point one on the jury pool itself. All juries are not created equal. When I practice law, for instance, in the United States Virgin Islands, everybody fought as hard as they could to get cases there because the jury was very favorable to plaintiffs. Average juror at that time had an eighth grade education. There's only 100,000 people who live in the U.S. Virgin Islands as citizens. So there was a very good chance that you might know the, the plaintiff or the plaintiff's family. And there were, as a result, really big verdicts that were regularly given down. Forum shopping is a big deal. There are good jury pools, good forums, bad forums, all of that factoring in. Okay, so that's point one. Point two is far more significant. Now that the Hunter Biden laptop has been introduced as evidence, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Hunter Biden laptop is real and that the contents of the Hunter Biden laptop are real as well. Four years after... Many people in the media allowed the idea to be spread by the 51 intelligence agents that this was some sort of Russian disinformation. The Hunter Biden laptop was introduced as evidence by the FBI, was accepted as evidence, and Hunter Biden has been convicted based partly on the evidence from inside of that laptop. It's real. Why does this matter? This is hugely important, and I have talked about it before, but I want all of you to follow me on this discussion because I think it's the most important takeaway now that cannot be disputed associated with Hunter Biden. In October of 2020, the New York Post published a story focused on the corruption of Joe Biden and Hunter Biden based on the evidence from the Hunter Biden laptop. They didn't focus on the hookers. They didn't focus on the crack. They didn't focus on the guns. All of that was readily apparent on the laptop. They focused on Hunter being paid millions of dollars by Ukrainian interest, by Chinese interest, that I believe corrupted Joe Biden's ability to be president of the United States in a trustworthy manner. That was the story from the New York Post in October of 2020, soon before the election itself. Immediately, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all of the big social media companies, many of the big media companies, Washington Post, New York Times, many of them, NPR, refused to cover or immediately discredited the New York Post story. One reason that they did that We know because Mark Zuckerberg talked about this and others inside of Twitter have discussed it as well is because the FBI had been briefing the social media companies in particular, maybe also the media companies. The FBI had been briefing them saying, beware of Russian disinformation being leaked to try to influence the 2020 election. So when this happened, a lot of people want to blame Twitter. They want to blame Facebook. When this story happened and there was an immediate attempt to censor it, the FBI was out there saying, hey, beware. In other words, the social media companies and maybe the big media companies too, I haven't seen them answer questions about this, were doing their best to try to avoid allowing Russia or China or some foreign interest to influence our election. That's because of the FBI briefings. But, and this is so key, and if you want to focus on anything, if you're in Congress on a staff and you're watching this clip, if you are a Republican congressman, Republican senator, and you're watching this clip, if you're inside of the Trump administration, potential future administration, inside of the Trump campaign, this is so important. 
Someone in the FBI ordered the code red here because the FBI had been in possession of Hunter Biden's laptop since 2019. They had had this for nearly a year and they had validated it through Apple. They knew that Hunter Biden's laptop was 100% real, yet they gave all of this talking points and all of these briefings to the big tech companies to try to make it seem like the Hunter Biden laptop might not be real. Someone inside of the FBI, maybe a group of people inside of the FBI for Joe Biden based on this laptop. There is ample evidence that the election would have swung in the other direction if this laptop had been accurately covered for the big story that it was relating to the Biden family being paid by Ukraine by Chinese interest. If that had occurred, there is evidence that supports Joe Biden would have lost the election. Who? The FBI knew it was real, and yet they were briefing these big tech companies and these big media companies as if the laptop were not real. That allowed them to censor it restrict many people's knowledge of its contents, it also opened the door for the 51 intelligence agents who came out and said that this laptop had all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. It allowed lies to be spread widely. Four years later, the FBI introduces the laptop at trial, says it's 100% authentic, Yet, they spent five years, took them five years to officially introduce it as evidence. They got it in 2019. That's a crime. Whoever inside of the FBI, whatever group of people, knew the laptop was real and allowed briefings to be occurring saying that they didn't know or that it might be Russian disinformation intentionally for Joe Biden, they got away with it. It's a big, huge, seismic deal. Still hasn't been covered enough. We know that based on that laptop. This is a big story. Um, I think it needs to be talked about. So those are my two big takeaways uh, from the uh, election itself. Um, uh, Sorry, from the Hunter Biden case itself, dealing with how it impacted the 2020 election. This matters because if they were willing to do that in 2024, 2020, what are they going to be willing to do in 2024? Uh, other news that is out there. Uh, Leah Thomas, not allowed to swim in the Olympics. This is the right decision. I saw Riley Gaines tweet, and I agree with her, that the NCAA should now remove Leah Thomas from NCAA record books because clearly she should not be a women's sports champion. Also, While I agree with the decision, and many people out there are saying, oh, well, this means that Leah Thomas can't swim in the Olympics. No, it doesn't. Leah Thomas can swim in the Olympics. He just has to do it as a man, which is what. So it's perfectly logical. Here's the thing that's a little bit scary, though. The Olympic body making this ruling said that Leah wasn't eligible to swim as a woman because the transition hadn't started before began puberty. It's a big deal. Because actually what it's encouraging is super young kids to be transitioned. Uh, This shouldn't happen anywhere. But this is particularly scary because they're actually saying Leah would have been eligible to swim as a woman if had started getting gender reassignment treatments before he began puberty. No child should be getting uh, puberty-changing drugs at any age before 18. I don't think it's healthy, frankly, even after the age of 18, to be getting opposite hormones of what your body is. In other words, women getting testosterone or men getting estrogen. But this is, I think, super scary that the official Olympic Committee decision would actually, in some ways, encourage young children to receive uh, these 
puberty treatments before transitioning uh, to be able to compete in the Olympics. Several other things. Um, Story comes out. We've talked about the WNBA making disastrous decisions as it pertains to Caitlin Clark, uh, not putting her on the Olympics team as the most recent. Story from the Washington Post, the WNBA is going to lose $50 million this year, even with Caitlin Clark. This is a nearly 30-year-old league that has never managed to make a dollar in its entire history. For everyone out there that is complaining that WNBA players are not being paid enough, do you have season tickets? Are you giving substantial of your own dollars to the WNBA to allow these women to be paid? Based on pure economics, the WNBA players are actually overpaid because their league has never made a dollar and is being subsidized by NBA players. In reality, but for the, uh, uh, the woke universe, the WNBA wouldn't exist because it hasn't been proven to have an audience. Caitlin Clark shows up, actually tries to help with the audience, and they trip all over themselves. But even with her this year, the WNBA is on track to lose $50 million. So every time these women come out and complain because they have to fly commercial, I bet if you work at a company that's losing $50 million a year, you probably fly commercial. I doubt they're chartering jets for you. The company makes no money um, and never has. It's lost hundreds of millions of dollars. It might have lost a billion dollars. These women are being paid despite the fact that the market so far has said there is no interest in the product that you're selling. This is not a business This is a charity. Um, Data point that I thought was positive. 18 to 29-year-olds, according to Axios this morning I was reading, are potentially going to vote for Donald Trump over Joe Biden. If that were to occur, it would be the first time that Republicans have won 18 to 29-year-old voters since George H.W. Bush in 1988. Reagan, of course, won in 84 because he won 49 states. No Republican has won the youth vote going all the way back to 1988. At a minimum, Trump is going to be the closest since the 2000 election. I think that is a pretty significant factor here. Uh, 18 to 29-year-olds. I ripped a lot of young people over the stupidity surrounding Palestine and trying to argue that somehow Israel is the bad side. But there is, I believe, a rebellion of sorts among young people who recognize that they have been lied to through COVID, that they've largely been lied to about Trump, and they are seeing through the noise, and this may end up being a competitive voting block. You know, the only group that Trump wins big right now, Gen X. It's kind of fascinating to think about, right? Why are Gen X voters overwhelmingly Trump supporters? I think, look, I'm Gen X by like eight months. I was born in April of 1979. If I had been born eight months later, I would be a millennial and I would have fallen apart and I'd probably be crying on air right now with all of you. Um, I think Gen X sees through BS. And most of us who grew up in the 80s and the 90s uh, have a large BS detector on And we recognize how much we're being lied to. And Trump, while imperfect, is crazily more honest by far than most of the media that covers him. A couple of other stories that are out there. Uh, The Celtics have opened up a 3-0 lead in the uh, NBA Finals. I've watched some of this. It's been an incredibly boring series. Nobody can even come up with topics to talk about because the Celtics have been so dominant. Probably going to close it out Friday. I'll give you some picks with prize picks. But the news story is, oh, we're going to attack Luka because he doesn't play defense. Hello? Have you never watched Luka play before? He's not a great defender. The Dallas Mavericks are a flawed team. The only reason they're in the NBA Finals is because of Luka and Kyrie. They carried this team, put them on their back. The Celtics are just a lot better. 
And so the, I feel like there's a desperate request to try to find something to talk about in this game. And after Brian Windhorst went off on Luka, that's the topic of discussion today. The reality is this. NBA's got a bad product. And Luka is one of the reasons why some people are willing to watch. Nobody really cares that strongly about the Celtics. Nobody really cares that strongly. Kyrie is fun to watch, 32. NBA product is not good. And uh, this argument, oh, this player doesn't play enough defense, it feels desperate to me. Nobody's watching. The NBA ratings are in the tank. And it looks like they're going to get a sweep. This may be the least watched NBA uh, finals going back years and years uh, in terms of how all of that is going to go. So uh, worth paying attention there. Finally, the Big 12 is talking about selling their conference naming rights. You've seen, obviously, many different stadiums, many bowl games sell naming rights. Talk is that they could get 30 or $50 million for this. I will do here the same thing that I typically do for uh, stadiums. I'm not saying a sponsor name as a part of the game, right? I'll talk about the Rose Bowl. I don't even know who sponsors the Rose Bowl. Uh, now, sometimes if it's funny, like the Pop-Tart Bowl is actually funny. I might mention it there in a bowl game. But historically, I don't know who sponsors the Sugar Bowl. I don't know who sponsors the Orange Bowl or the Fiesta Bowl. Um, I think it's uh, kind of pathetic if the Big 12 sells its conference naming rights. But I suspect that if they get $50 million to do it, somewhere down the line, every other conference is going to do the same. And it's just going to be a free-for-all to go grab the money. But for my purposes... The Big 12, I'll stick to it, even though they don't have 12 members, and I get it. The Big 10 has whatever it is, 16 members now, 18 members. I'm not even sure what the number is. Uh, But I'm not going to uh, change the way that I talk about these conferences. Maybe you can say it's smart to take the money if it's out there. I think renaming your entire conference just for an advertiser is crazy. Now, I say that. I, I wouldn't rename Outkick the show, I don't think. But if somebody paid me enough money... I'd probably rename this show. So, look, I'm a capitalist. I don't begrudge anybody doing it. Um, but uh, I, I just think uh, I just think it's funny that this is how far down the capitalism road we've gotten, that the whole conference itself can be renamed. It reminds me of, I've made this analogy, the Berlin Wall coming down. And when the Berlin Wall came down and suddenly Eastern Europe was open, you could buy anything. They didn't just go from communism to capitalism. They went from communism to unrestrained capitalism. So suddenly you could buy a kidney or you could buy a nuclear weapon uh, or you could buy a tank. Everything was for sale. They went from you can't buy anything to everything being for sale overnight. And I feel like that's suddenly what we've got in college athletics. We went from We're going to make guys ineligible if they sign their autograph to you all get Lamborghinis instantaneously. And now we've got literally the conference itself, the name of the conference is for sale. Just like in Eastern Europe, hey, I want to buy a tank and I'm going to need your kidney too. They were like, sure, kidney for sale. I don't know if that's a good uh, Russian accent or not, Uh, but that's what happened. You could buy anything. Uh, That's what's going on right now in uh, college athletics. All right. Love all of you. I'm off to go watch my 13-year-old's basketball game. I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, appreciate you all. Uh, my name is Clay Travis. DBAP unless you need to SBAP. This has been Outkick the Show.